I'm excited to listen to our next guest speaker. He is a, a co-founder of Horizon and board, part of the board of a, and advisor of uh, Send Blockchain Foundation. So please, let's give him a very wa uh, warm welcome to Rolf Versus. Welcome, Rolf. Thank you. Thanks, Angie. It is great to be here. Angie reminded me that I last saw her in Bogota, Colombia. I think that was almost five years ago when we went to a uh, Bitcoin and crypto conference. And so I'm getting to see so many people that I haven't seen for years, people that I've worked with but haven't ever met for years, and just enjoying the general positive nature of this conference. It's really wonderful. So I'm going to tell some stories um, about the early launching and building of Horizon, then known as Zen Cash. And let's see, I'm assuming that we do green here for next. And then you're going to find out why we have the culture we do. It's evolved somewhat, I'm sure. But there's also very specific things that happened uh, that are kind of, I don't know, hot points, psychological trauma, something like that, uh, that account for the things that we do. Here's one of the videos that I would do. These, these are the whiteboard videos that before we launched Zen Cash, um, I'd get up and talk about what it is that we were going to do and why we were going to do it. And part of the reason that I was doing this and Rob wasn't doing this uh, is you know, we had gotten together and talked about building uh, Zen Cash as a, as a chain split because we had very specific ideas and we came from two different directions. Rob came from the, we were, we were both officers in the US military, he was Air Force and I was Navy, so we had that commonality expectation of success, results-oriented, uh, the ability to work in small teams with a very focused uh, uh, desire to succeed. So that was a good starting point. He came from a mathematics and physics and academic sta uh, sta starting point and had done a lot of research into different uh, cryptocurrency and the crypto economics. And I came from a standpoint of, after leaving the Navy, working in the business world. And I had uh, gone into technical sales, worked for Cisco Systems, and then started my own business back in 2002, grew it to 60 people, and then sold that in 2015. And that gave me the time to get involved in Bitcoin and crypto mining in, in 2016. And it led to us kind of meeting together and deciding that this was a great opportunity to launch something new. And the first year, was crazy. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but one of the really important things was that we had a community from the very beginning because we came from the Z Classic community where there was a large privacy and freedom component. I'm, I'm sure some of those people are still there. Um, but we had no ability to pay people at the beginning. So the people that did stuff were people that volunteered, stepped up, and got things done. And looking back, that was a great filter for putting, having people join our team, people that wanted to do things and had the ability to see what needed to be done and then do it. That's great in any kind of team. Um, privacy in blockchain was kind of an unknown. We didn't know if we were going to be getting knocks on the door from the SEC or, or, or other regulatory agencies. I'll just say regulators. Um, but we made a lot of early decisions that we thought were useful and we came from a perspective uh, of our shared perspectives of the, the crypto economics and small business owner. But one of the big things that I always encourage people to do if you're going to go into business is go for an exponential S-curve market. If, if you have a, a good knowledge of technology and you can see that there's a new t technology that's coming and it's going to go through the typical S-curve where it crosses the chasm at 30 points and then goes, ramps up, um, you know, television, internet, uh, running water. There's all sorts of technologies that have rapid adoption curves. Certainly the internet's been one of the recent ones. And I had missed so many of them in my life. I had missed the PC revolution, the internet revolution. I built my business around the uh, enterprise voice over IP transformation, so that was helpful. So I had experience with an S-curve market. And I looked at crypto and I'm like, this is, this is awesome. This is a no-brainer. This is a slam dunk. We just got to get in here somehow and then we'll succeed. So. The other cool thing about an S-curve market is it's wide open. You don't have a lot of competitors. You just got to get in there with an idea and work and be ready to adjust. You don't have to worry about what the competitors are doing because you can carve your own path to success. So some of these early decisions that we made, um, we noticed a lot of the projects were formed by technologists. And some of them seemed that they were almost like 
toys to them, and they didn't really care about them. And others, they obviously hadn't had business experience. Um, and <laughs> like when I was on the submarine and going all over the Pacific, we would have a plan, and then we'd have a backup plan, and then we'd have a backup plan to the backup plan, because anytime something went wrong, if it went wrong, everybody died. And that was the penalty for, for messing up on a nuclear submarine. And so after that, in the business world, anything else was easier because dying usually wasn't one of the penalties of, of failing. So, you know, we're willing to try anything. Now, we did take proven technology because we like to experiment, but not too much. So we got the idea of having a treasury from Zcash, the zero knowledge proofs from Zcash. We did proof of work because Bitcoin had demonstrated that proof of work was working. And um, from Dash, we got the idea of master nodes, of people, people running nodes. One of the big things in creating a new project is getting people to care about it. And that, that was actually the, the major issue. And so, you know, we've talked about community a little bit today. And so, the way I looked at community is we had GPU miners, we had software developers, we had speculators, we had privacy enthusiasts. And it'd be great to be able to grow our community larger. And the people that I wanted to go after were the systems administrators, the DevOps people. Because they're the guys that fix your printer, they're the guys that help you, uh, women too, of course, that gets th things going. And by designing a node that had a maybe two to $400 entry point, we could get system administrators who, you know, could buy some Zen and and we figured our, our, the Zen price after launch was going to be, I don't know, 5 to $10 or something like that. So we set the number of Zen required to run a node, kind of the skin in the game is 42. Because, you know, I read a lot of science fiction. And that's the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy's uh, answer to life, the universe, and everything. Um, so we, from a business owner's standpoint, the awesomest thing was I didn't have to have salespeople that I had to pay commission. Because the way we designed it, of having funds coming into the treasury with every block, means that we had cash flow right away. Now, we could increase the uh, ability of that cash flow by getting more people to buy Zen, and uh, more Zen than was created every two and a half minutes. So a lot of what we were working to do was lay out a foundation for what we were planning to do and getting people to buy Zen and then hold on to it. When we transitioned over and did the chain split from Z Classic, we realized that about 80% of the Zen in existence was on our one exchange that loved and supported us, uh, Bitrex. And so part of what we designed was to get Zen off the exchange and make it uh, more sticky for people to sell it so there wouldn't be as much volatility in the price. So part of the things that we designed, um, well, a shielded transaction pool would get Zen off the exchange. Nodes would get Zen off the exchange. And when later on when we talked about side chains, side chains get Zen off the exchange. So there was a method behind the madness. Um, also, if we wanted uh, software development, we would pay for it. If we wanted people to run nodes, we would pay for it. And so that came from you know, the business world of things where you don't beg people to do work for you. You don't expect people to do stuff for free. You act in, in a way that helps people uh, align with their interests. So there's all sorts of things that, you know, when Rob and I met at the University of South Carolina in Columbia, South Carolina, and hashed these things out over a beer, um, there, there was a lot of discussion, there was a lot of thought. We got lucky on some things, don't get me wrong, but, um, you know, we were able to launch successfully. And it was great for a day or two. And then the defining culture of Zen started to develop through all the problems that we had to address. And we had a lot of problems. It was fun talking about this at lunch because every time we brought up a problem, it would remind us of a different one. Uh, and, and it would be like we would have nonstop problems. And this is to be expected in a new technology and a new industry. And like I said, it, from being in the military where, where, where death is an option of failure, uh, public embarrassment was, was minor. So, you know, we had a delayed launch. There was transaction replays attacks. And the whole list, I'm not going to go through these things. I'd be happy to talk with any of you all about the details of these and uh, bring up some of the other ones afterwards. But what it did allow us to do was to develop a problem addressing methodology that baked into our culture. So there would be a problem. Yep, we'd find out about it. Hopefully we'd find out about before the press did, but we'd find out about it. Then we'd let people know. 
We'd talk about it. We'd brainstorm some ideas, and then very quickly we would uh, come into a short and a long-term solution where we would mitigate the issues of the problem, and then we would address the root cause and work towards fixing the root cause of the problem, and then we would move on. Because if you want to accomplish things in life, you can't just be reactive. You have to be proactive. You have to have your agenda, and you have to go after it, and you have to drive for it. And if you're always responding to problems, that's not going to work. And so we wouldn't obsess over it, but there are a ton of problems. Um, so Rob and I worked really well together. And I had already had my startup and, and company building experience. And that's a character forming experience. And I was eager for Rob to have that experience. And so I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'd love for you to be the leader. And you know, I'll be the, uh, the, the sales guy to start out with in business development. And maybe we can get some other person to take that over at some point. And then I'll become a member of the board and a mentor. And you know, we can talk about things and, and you can make things happen. So it was, it was great on, on both sides. Um, and one of the things that we were both in agreement on was we had the experience of when we wanted to do business with an organization that you'd go find out who the people behind the business are. What's their track record? Have they done other things that are similar before? Because anybody can say anything that they're going to do something or say they have experience, but if you look back towards someone's track record of success or failure, you get a feel for what type of people they are. Do they do the basic thing of saying they're going to do something and then do it. Because, you know, if you do that, that puts you ahead of 90% of the people out there. So that's a, that's a pretty good starting point. So we were resolved to be very public about our background, our intentions, what was going on with the project. And that resonated with a certain amount of people within the cryptocurrency um, realm, the community. And coincidentally, these were the type of people that we wanted to have in our community, the people that um, would be able to, even though there's lots of talk in cryptocurrency about developing trustless systems, at some point there's people behind those systems that are working to accomplish things, and, and you kind of got to put your trust in them. So we wanted to be trustworthy people. There were other projects that had entirely anonymous people, and you didn't know what they were going to do. Um, so we resolved not to be that type of thing. Um, and so another thing was that we knew that you never had enough information to make a perfect decision. So what I had learned early on, and I'm sure Rob had uh, as well, is you gather enough information and then you take action. And by the very nature of taking action, it opens up other information that you wouldn't have had if you didn't take action. And then you find out if you took the right action or not. If you did, then you continue on. If you didn't, you, you readjust quickly. Um, so that helped us to kind of move fast and break things, which is what you want to do when you're starting and growing. And you kind of have to be unreasonable. So you, you have to decide, I'm going to do this, and whatever stands in my way, I'm going to find a bunch of ways to get it done. Might not be the first way I try, but I'm going to resolve to go in this direction, and anytime there's a setback, I'm just going to find a different way to accomplish what I'm looking to do. So that, that helped. Um, you know, those doubts crept up every once in a while. Um, but that's okay. You could quiet those down. It's not, it's not. Um, one thing that Rob was really, really good at that I wasn't good at uh, is making contacts in the industry. And that really helped us a lot. So, for example, after we launched, we realized that the programmer that we had worked with and thought he was, uh, you know, competent, uh, turned out that he had coded in a zero-day attack, well, a seven-day after a launch attack, that allowed for transaction replays. So seven days after we launched, um, Bittrex told us, hey, we're seeing transaction replays, we're shutting down deposits and withdrawals. People can still trade. And we're like, great, so people can sell? Um, and, and that's what was happening. And, but Rob knew the owner of Bittrex. They were a four-person company then. And he's like, Rolf, you've got to talk to these guys. So I talked to the owner of Bittrex. And um, turns out they are former Microsoft security professionals. He's like, we see this kind of stuff all the time. Here's what you've got to do. First off, you've got to get developers that are going to fix the problem. And then you have to make sure that twice a day, you publicly tell everybody in your community what's going on and what you're doing to fix it. Even if you have no update, get out there and tell them that you have no update. 
So if you go to the Horizon website and you look back to the very early blog posts and the very early videos on YouTube, you will see during this period, it was about a one week period, but it just seems like it's a lot longer, that Rob and I would be doing updates twice a day to our community about what the problem was, what we were doing to address it, and what the situation was going forward. And this is where another one of Rob's contacts, Charles Hoskinson at IOHK, really helped us out. Because he's like, well, I got this team in Ukraine. Um, they're really good at C++ and learning new stuff. Um, how about I have them help solve your code problem? And we're like, yeah, that'd be great. How much money do you want? He's like, just consider it a favor. I'm like, wow, that's a really good offer. And you know what? They did. They fixed it. They learned our code, fixed it, uploaded the fix, and within a week, we were up and running on, on Bittrex again. So those were, that's just one example of you know, a potentially project-ending event that we had to deal with. And then we did other basic things of you know, trying to hire well. Of course, it's hard to, to, um, to hire when you're a, a project that doesn't actually have any funds coming in um, and, and, and no way to distribute the funds. So we quickly fixed that and uh, started working towards that. We had also promised people that if they were running nodes, that we would pay them. <laughs> We didn't really have a way to do that either. But we did know with leadership and culture and funds that we could hire people to do that. And so uh, Alan uh, came in and said, you know, I, I got a way that we can figure out a way to track nodes and pay them. And so, so we did that. So things were coming together. And we did the basic things of delegating authority and responsibility, and it worked great. But the bear market was tough. The prices then went down. That means our treasury funds went down. And we did all sorts of different things. You know, Rob was firmly in charge and doing all sorts of things to try to mitigate this. We changed the payout to the treasury. We rebranded to Horizon to expand our universe of potential community members. We created super nodes for, for more demand to, to increase the demand and compared to the supply. Uh, we did all sorts of things, but it wasn't looking good. And then, Rob and Dean and Liat got together and decided to make Horizon Labs. And I'm like, that's brilliant. Because at that point, we could give the opportunity for private venture to invest in a portion of, not, not Horizon itself, but in Horizon Labs. It would fund engineers. And then instead of having to hire and lay off people uh, at the whims of the market, we'd be able to have a core set of engineers and, and, and marketing and, and other folks that were essential to the business, like project managers. And then we could, when, when we had a higher value of Zen, work with Horizon Labs and, and, and do more. And then Horizon Labs could pursue for-profit businesses. So it's a great combination. Uh, so that worked out really well. And as of today, Zen Blockchain Foundation, Horizon Labs, work really well together. I'm so happy with just how everything's working and how the things that we visualized and talked about and, and gamed out are all coming to fruition. Sure, it takes longer than, than you might think and maybe that you want, but it takes a long time to develop the things. And we're, we still talk about the same original ideas uh, that, that we had. We just realized that we couldn't do that on the main chain because it would quickly make the main chain too big and that side chains were a solution. So stepping back and developing the side chains to do a DAO for, for voting, to maybe shift private transactions to a side chain, uh, to do all sorts, uh, to do an automated node payout system. All these things could be done on the side chain. They take time to develop, especially for a project that's in progress and you want to keep it up and running. Okay.